Welcome everyone to the Savvy Ladies Wednesday Wisdom Webinar. I'm Maggie Montemuro and I'm the Marketing Manager at Savvy Ladies. If you have a question during the webinar, you can type it into the chat box. And if you're joining us by phone, you can email your question to info at SavvyLadies.org. Today's presenter is Linda Matthew, owner of Money Mindful Personal Finance Coaching. Linda is an accredited financial counselor with more than 20 years of professional experience in numerical and economic analysis and 10 years of training in emotional healing. She offers individual sessions and classes, both in person and online, to help clients identify where they are financially, decide where they would like to be, and make a plan to get there. Originally from South Africa, Linda combines both analytics and emotions to help her clients take care of their finances. Thanks for joining us today, Linda, and I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Linda Matthew. Um, I'm very happy to be here with everyone today. I am, let's see if I can switch this slide. There we go. We're going to be talking today about money mindfulness and how paying attention to our feelings can help us create a financially healthy life. So I put my picture up in the corner of each of these slides just to make it a bit more personal. It makes me feel more as if I'm actually talking to each of you since we don't have any video. Um, as Maggie said, please feel free to ask any questions as I go along. Um, you can type them into the little chat box. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and I'll likely save them for the end, but if there's anything that needs to be addressed right away, I can definitely stop and do that. So when I started doing this work many years ago, um, I really thought that, and by this work, I mean helping people with their finances. I really thought that if I could show people how to work with their finances, what they needed to do, this and this and this, then that would take care of things and everything would go better for them. But what I was finding was that that wasn't working. So people would meet with me and I would help them put together a plan and then they go away and somehow a month later or three months or six months later, nothing had changed for them. They were in the same spot. And I couldn't figure out what was missing. So I made uh, a little drawing here just for you guys, just to make the slides a bit more interesting. Um, and actually, while I have this here, I want to make a comment that in feng shui, pigs are a symbol of prosperity. So I, I like to bring pigs into this work wherever I can. Um, so a good analogy for the problem that I was running into here is it's like when you want to get in shape physically. And let's say someone came up to you and said, well, you need to exercise, right? Well, duh, that's like I came up to you and said, well, you need a budget. Um, that's not news to anybody. And then maybe the person even gave you a specific plan and they said, okay, so you need to do this kind of exercise and you need to do it this many times a day and so on and so forth. And that's important and it's valuable because there is this critical piece of knowing exactly what we need to do. But then I'm sure you know that so much can go wrong after that. Um, the information is important, but then in addition to that, there has to be this sort of energy that has to collect itself so that we can actually implement this plan and things come up and sometimes it doesn't quite go the way we expect it and it's easy to get discouraged and so on and so on. So money is an exact analogy to this. This is the, the same way that it goes with our finances. So sometime after that, I started a program of personal work and that was exploring my own emotions and how they work in my relationships with other people and with myself. And after several years of doing that, I began to incorporate what I was learning in my work with my clients. And that was when I saw things start to change for people. Because the truth is that our relationship with money is not a rational one. It's really just like a marriage and sometimes like a difficult marriage. This relationship with money can be stormy, it can be uncomfortable, it can be annoying. It might not go the way we thought it would. And then it can be really easy to blame ourselves or to fall into despair. But the truth is that all of this stuff is completely normal. That's just the way it goes with money. And so it's really important to stay in touch with the emotions because money can be a very scary thing. It's so critical to our survival. Um, and then beyond that, it gets all tied up with our self-image, with our self-worth, all of these things. So if we're finding ourselves stuck in the emotional side of money, 
um, or if we really want to change our situation and somehow it's just not happening, how do we work with all of this? It may be that we know how to do a budget and for some reason we're just not getting around to it. Or maybe if we have a spouse or a, part or a partner, it may be that there are disagreements there that are keeping things stuck. Um, maybe we can't seem to save money even though we know we want to and it bothers us that we're not doing it. All of these things are examples of the emotional side and how that comes into play. So what I've found in my work is that ideally we want to maintain a focus on two things at once. We want to work through our numbers and at the same time we want to be noticing what our emotions are as we do that. So for example, you could check yourself right now as we're sitting here, if you're sitting quietly and somewhat in touch with what's going on inside yourself, just sort of check and notice what happens if I say, okay, it's time to start working through your finances. And notice the body's response to that, what you feel as I say that. And I know, you know, it's the middle of, of a work day and this can be kind of a difficult exercise to dive right into, but I just wanted to give you a little sense of it and you can take some time later just to notice how you feel about your finances. And so this leads us straight to the first emotion that I usually see and that we usually find when we're working with our finances. Um, and I'm wondering, there's a little, you know, there's the chat box that I mentioned, if people can figure out how to work that, um, I'm wondering, can anyone guess what the first emotion is that most people have when they come in to work on their finances? Um, just if you if you can get to it, just type into the chat box what your first guess would be. Okay, good, super. We've got an embarrassment, worry, very nice, anxiety or fear, 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 fear. <laughs> right, nervous, exactly. So very good, you guys. So what I get from most people when they first come in, ninety nine percent of the time, it's fear. And anxiety, nervous, embarrassed, worried, can you see how all of those are kind of around the same area? We all start with fear. Here's the thing, this is good news, believe it or not. The thing with fear is we can usually count on it to be there, particularly with our finances, and fear is the great reminder. So fear says to us, hey, you feel fear, don't forget your emotions. So it's the reminder, it's like the ringing of the doorbell, hello, check with your emotions. Often what happens is when we feel fear, our instinctive tendency, or really if we feel anything, is to shut it down. Our instinctive tendency is to shut that down. And here, what we actually want to do is the opposite. We want to sit with it. So in this case, what you would do is you'd notice where it is in your body. See if you can sense some fear right now. Notice where it is in your body, breathe into it, make some space, and just see if you can be there and keep it company and learn about it really. Like, where is it? What does it feel like? All of those things. Sometimes it's hard, I know. So it may be that, you know, for the first time, you just want to try to be there with it for say two minutes. And honestly, this is the bulk of the exercise. It sounds so simple. You might've heard the expression, awareness is 80% of the battle. And that's true. And I would actually add that um, presence is the other 20%. So when we notice our fear, and we become aware of it, then we sit there and give it some attention, it can really help. You could even have a little conversation with it. You could say, what are you afraid of? And you'd get a better understanding of yourself. So some of the fears will be unlikely things. I'm afraid that a mountain lion will show up outside my window, probably not going to happen. Um, but some of them could well be pretty smart and they might even help you, for example, make a list of what your top priorities are in your finances. Oh, I'm really scared about this. Okay, well, good. Then that's your top priority. That's what we need to be attending to. So this is an example of how you could actually elicit the help of your emotions for some guidance. Now fear, if you think about it, it's a pretty smart emotion because it's an, in its best form, it teaches us what not to do and it sort of keeps us from getting into trouble. So this practice of being with fear, I also want to add, can be really important if you're working with a partner on finances. If you have a spouse or partner, um, sometimes just to have a partner bring up the topic or ask a question can trigger this fear. And if we don't notice it, that'll very quickly turn into a defensive response. And from there, wind up in some kind of an argument because typically we'll just sort of attack back, we'll react. 
So back in the day when my husband and I first started working with us, what we did was we had this rule and we said that if one of us wanted to talk about money, we'd have to go to the other person and say, I would like to talk about money and then wait and let the other person take three deep breaths. And what that did was it slowed things down just enough that we could actually catch that instinctive reaction, feel the fear, and just slow down enough that we didn't lash back um, or block. And now, of course, if you're single, you can do the exact same thing with yourself. You don't need to have an external person, um, but you could slow down and say, I would like to work on money. Give yourself the time to take three deep breaths so that you can slow down internally, notice the fear, and then notice that instinctive tendency to block um, or to react and then move on to whatever the problem is. So it's kind of like that t-shirt says, you know, feel the fear um, and then go ahead. Okay, so, so the question is, why would something this simple be so important? Um, and the reason for that is that this avoidance of our emotions can be so instinctive, particularly with the difficult emotions. And then that can turn into an avoidance of our finances. Because at many levels, it's the emotion, it's the fear that we're avoiding. And it's like, oh, well, if I just don't deal with my finances, then I won't have to feel the fear. And so that's really where the trouble starts. Um, because if there's one thing that our finances need in order to thrive, it is our regular time and attention. So let's take a look at some more of the emotions. Here's another drawing for you right there. So sadness can often be the thing that follows fear. And I have a client right now, for example, who's working through some old loans um, and he's feeling deep regret that he's ignored them for so long. It's been many years. Um, and so in this case, regret, it's a form of sadness. And that may be one of the things that we have to go through when we start this process. And that's okay. The main thing to remember here is that all of these feelings are okay and they're all normal. Often we were taught somewhere, often as children, to avoid our emotions. I mean, if you think about it, how often have you heard a grown up say, oh, don't be scared. So, so to do the opposite and to dive into it, it may not really be comfortable because we're not used to it. But if we can do that, if we truly grieve the things that we're grieving and take time for it, then often that can free us up so that we can move forward with taking care of things. And in this case of my client who's working with the loans, he has to remind himself to stay with the sadness. And when he does that, then that really helps to let the feeling wash through. And eventually it moves out because the feelings are kind of like a river. It comes in, it washes through, it moves out if we don't block it. And then the next one comes in and so on. So I had another client who felt sad about her finances because her husband had died. Um, and this was a terrible loss. Um, and then what happened was every time she sat down to try, try to take care of things, it brought it all back. And it reminded her again of how alone she felt. And then that would bring on the sadness. So it was a double whammy, really. And in her case, it took a few years before she was ready to take it on. And then when we first started working together, the sadness was always there. Um, until she gradually began to feel something new because she really did learn how to do things herself. And then it shifted and it moved almost towards more of an excitement. So now in her case, she had that additional loss of her husband and that's, you know, obviously very difficult. Um, but I think that for many people, there can be this sadness associated just because we realize that we really do have to take care of this ourselves. Um, just a, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was working with a client and I asked her, you know, how are things going with this problem that she was busy sorting out? And she said, well, no one's shown up to fix it for me yet. And so there's that piece, right, of sensing into, oh, I have to do this. I have to take this on alone. And that can be a form of sadness. All right, let's talk about something a little more energetic, anger. Um, so anger is an interesting emotion. Um, and again, I keep saying this, in many ways we've been trained not to feel it. And it's really important to realize here that when we talk about anger, I'm not talking about acting out. I'm not suggesting you go around and bop people on the head. It's just the pure feeling that I'm talking about with no action attached to it. And that can be very energizing. If you just sense into, for a moment, sense into what it feels like to be angry and how that really brings a great energy to the body. Um, I'll give you another example. I had a client recently who was a young woman and she had begun to bring her expenses into line with her income. 
And what that meant was spending less. And she had quite a bit of debt that she was going to have to pay off. And what happened with her was for the first while, whenever she went out and she saw an advertisement or a billboard with, you know, like with a dinner special or anything tempting her to buy something, she would get really angry. And she was really mad at these people because they were conspiring to separate her from her money. And so this is a great example because this is like a coming alive experience. It's like that feeling, you know, when um, you've had a frostbite or your, your foot has fallen asleep or something and you get that painful feeling in your toes when they start to wake up as the blood begins to flow. There's this intense feeling at first. And so the anger is like that. It's a great sign that we're waking up. Um, and actually, in traditional Chinese medicine, I wanted to add in acupuncture and so on, anger is the emotion that's associated with the season of spring. So it's the energy of change, it's the energy of new beginnings, it's the energy that gets things moving. Um, so, so this can be a great emotion to feel, to just really get mad. Um, here's another example of that, again, going back to the... My, my own life, my husband told me that when we first started to put together our own budget and spending plan, he would get really angry um, and he didn't want to be boxed in. He wanted to be able to spend whatever he wanted to spend. And so there again, that anger is an important part of the process um, because it can be the first reaction as we start to sense the limits of our income and sense how, you know, at some level we really are boxed in. We can look at it differently, but it, you know, it feels like a box. We feel that we have to limit ourselves and the anger shows that we're starting to really wrestle with that reality and take it on. So we've talked about fear. We've talked about sadness. We've talked about anger. And every once in a while we get a break and we get to feel happy or even excited. Um, I had a client recently who had a small victory. He found out that something that he was afraid was wrong was actually exactly the way it needed to be, something about the way he was doing with his finances. And uh, he was just so happy about that, that he got up and he danced around the table. Um, and often when someone comes in at the beginning of a session feeling worried about their finances, we sit down and work at it. Um, we'll get to the end of the hour and by the end of just an hour, you know, they can be feeling excited because they're seeing possibilities often because the situation, once we look at it, is actually not as bad as the fear that they had had. Um, and so many times, once we actually get started, then the feeling can be one of relief. It's like that oh, feeling um, that we're actually moving on it. Um, so there are a couple of feelings that you might notice that I have not mentioned. Um, and these two are hopelessness and shame. And the reason I haven't included them here is because you may be able to see that neither of them is actually a feeling, a true feeling at all. They're both triggered from our thoughts. We tell ourselves something and then create a feeling around that. So hopelessness, for example, is when we think, oh, this will never work out. It's just hopeless. And then the feeling associated with that might be fear. It might be sadness, could be anger. Um, Sometimes with hopelessness, we may not actually feel anything at all because it's kind of as if we've given up, just kind of, uh, um, so there may even not be any feeling. Um, and so in that case, a good starting point there might be to see if you can actually find something like anger can often be an easy one to access, find some anger, whatever the feeling is associated with it. And then we can start there. Um, so I just want to add also that of everyone who has come to me feeling hopeless, even some situations that have really been pretty difficult to see our way through, um, there's no situation that I have seen yet, touch wood, that has turned out to be hopeless. Um, even when there are some pretty drastic changes that are needed somehow, um, it's always turned out that it can be done. Um, so those are my thoughts on hopelessness. And then to take a look at the shame, um, this is a really important one. What I often see is that, um, you know, we can feel as if like, I'm the only person on earth who's struggling with this problem. Everyone else has it together. There's just something wrong with me. And from this place, it's a really short step to beating ourselves up. Um, and that's a real concern. Um, it's such an important piece to pay attention to, just to notice with compassion when we're being hard on ourselves. Um, so I just want to tell everyone that it is the human condition to struggle with our finances. Of course, I see it every day in my work, but even when you look at the broader studies, um, all the studies I've seen have been done in the U.S., but speaking about the U.S. in general, 
it shows that the vast majority of the population is concerned about their finances um, and that most people, well over 50%, are uncertain of how to approach finances. Um, so I wanted to tell you I had a wonderful experience um, at the end of the very first money class that I offered, there was a woman in the class, she was about my age. Um, and in the last session, we had a circle um, so that people could summarize what they had learned in the class and what their intention was going forward, what the next thing was that they were going to work on. And so this woman was um, reflecting on what she had learned. Um, and she told us that she was feeling very relieved because when she came into the class, she had been feeling as if, you know, she had been feeling uncomfortable about the fact that she was struggling with her finances, feeling as if there was something wrong with her and that the reason was that she had not gotten uh, like, a, like a high enough education, a high enough degree. And she said, and here I am sitting in the circle and on my left, I have a medical doctor and on my right, I have a PhD. And I see that these people have exactly the same struggles that I do. And so I've learned that it's not because of this thing that I did wrong. It's just because that's what it is. And I thought that that was such a fantastic example of it, which is that when we actually get everyone together in a group where people can speak truth and we can hear the truth of what everyone else is wrestling with, that you know, we really find out that we all have the same problems regardless of who we are. Um, so for me, that's really the takeaway here. We all have our struggles. So for you know, with this stuff, really be gentle on yourselves. Um, by all means, feel sad, mad, afraid, but um, take care not to beat yourselves up. Um, so now I just want to add one more piece. So that was talking about all the emotions, and I want to go back to kind of where I started and add this one piece just to keep things in balance. Um, so if you remember, I started out by saying um, that we had to be working, we want to be working with the feelings and with the numbers at the same time. It's important to remember that both of those pieces are important. Um, we need to feel our feelings, certainly. But sometimes when we have trouble, it's easy to say, oh, you know, I'm having trouble because I have some, uh, I don't know, spiritual deficit. Um, but sometimes all we need, honestly, um, you know, is a good spreadsheet. Um, sometimes all we need is just the information about how exactly do I take on my finances. Um, so both of those people, pieces matter. So as you look at your own situation, consider where it is that you need to start. Um, is it that you know what you need to be doing? Maybe you've got a good budget book or whatever. Um, and it's the feelings that are keeping you stuck. Or is it that you literally don't know how to approach the situation? And in that case, the starting point would be to get some information or to get some help with the how to. And there, there are many ways to do this. You know, there, of course, there are videos all over the internet. There are many good books and so on. Um, one of my favorites, I'll just throw this in real quick, is um, a book called On My Own Two Feet, um, and the author is Thakor, T-H-A-K, sorry, T-H-A-K-O-R. It's a wonderful, small, helpful start at the very beginning book. Um, it's packaged for um, young women specifically, but much of the information is generic. It's obviously generic to women or men and for most of the age groups. Um, some extra details you would definitely want to add if you were older. Um, but so there's tons of information. If what you need is information, then get that. Um, but definitely keep both of these pieces in mind. We need to have the information, so get the necessary help about how to go forward. And then once we know what to do, feeling our feelings will make us easier to do, make it easier to do that without getting too stuck. Um, so that's so the last piece that I wanted to say, and then what I wanted to mention is that I have a couple of next steps. Um, if anyone would like some help going forward, there are a couple of options that I personally have coming up here that I would you know, certainly invite you to join me in. Starting in September, I've got an online class called Money 101 for Young Professionals. Um, and this is designed specifically for sort of the 22 to 32 year, age, year old category just that general place where you're starting out into your, in your career and we'll be covering things like um, how to budget, how to deal with the student loans um, while still starting to save, an introduction to investing and so on. 
Um, so if this is you, if this is of interest and um, you'd like to do it, by all means, jump in and sign up for the Money 101 for Young Professionals. I've got uh, my contact information there. Um, it's going to be a great class. The classes are always a lot of fun. So if this is you, um, come and join me. Um, the I did want to mention, well, actually, let me go forward. If this is not you, if you're not in this age group or if the class isn't appropriate to what you want to do, then um, the other thing that I have is a free 30-minute consultation. If you just have some questions that you would like to ask or something you're unclear on, um, let's have a 30-minute consultation. Um, we'll have a conversation. I'll get to hear a little bit about where you're coming from, um, and I can have some recommendations for you, some of which, which may include work with me, and uh, some may be just things that you can do on your own. So if you're interested in either of those, drop me an email um, or call or text me at this number. Um, the early reg, as I was going to say, the early reg de deadline for uh, Money 101 for Young Professionals is set to September 1st, and I did that several months ago, but um, I personally don't like being squeezed um, into a schedule. so. Um, I'll move that out to, uh, let's see, today's Wednesday, I'll move that out to Friday the 2nd so that people have a little bit of chance to, to think if you'd like to do that. Um, and then, and also for that class, I want to let everyone know I'm offering um, an extra 10% discount for the savvy ladies. Um, so by all means, get in touch if you're interested in either of those. And I have 27 minutes after the hour, and does anybody have any questions? about anything that we talked about or anything at all. Thanks, Linda. We did have a question um, the previous slide you were on asking what time are the online classes and if any part of it is recorded. Um, yes, the online class and so this is going to be maybe tricky for the East Coast folks. It's set up for 6 to 8 p.m. on Wednesday nights. The first one is September 14th. That I think is a Wednesday. Um, from 6 to 8 p.m. and um, they are recorded. If it's, it's a four session class that's spread out over six weeks and if for some reason you can't make a particular session then yes we will be recording, recording it. I do like to have everybody attend the first one um, just because that's when we form the group. It's a live class so we have an actual group and it can really be sort of a bonding experience so it's really nice to have everybody physically in the first one um, because that does, that does make a difference. Okay, great. Thanks for that information. And we also have a question about your presentation. Um, the question is, my partner has pretty much the exact opposite emotions when it comes to money. In, mm -hmm. your, in your experience, have you seen couples work through issues even when they have these differing views about finances? Yes, and that made me laugh because I have to say my husband and I have been married for almost 20 years and um, I would almost say that that's the definition of a marriage is that you find someone who's the opposite of you and then you try to wrestle through it. Um, so yes, it, it is common almost to the point of always being that way that the people have opposite emotions um, because we tend to balance each other out. And so, for example, in my case, we had this experience where I was the one who really wanted to take on the finances. And the reason was because I was feeling a ton of fear around that. So I was just feeling massive fear. You know, this was way back when, before we started working together. Um, and my husband just kind of, you know, took the opposite position. He didn't really want to, he said, you know, we're fine. We've got everything we need. Don't worry about it. But so the more he detached himself from the fear, the more afraid I became. And so this is often the way it goes, is that balance. And absolutely, once we get into conversation between the two, um, often you know, you'll need a good facilitator because we need to sort of slow things down and really get into what's going on behind those comments so that each person can start to hear one another and then some compassion builds up and absolutely we can move forward. And, this is the really great thing about partners because when we can get um, the two partners on the same page, get the two partners pulling in the same direction, it can really change the outcome. And that's one of my favorite pieces of this work. So yes, it's common and yes, it's doable. Okay, great, good to know. And another question is, I just started my payoff plan four months ago. 
My question is, how do I deal with the sad, resentful, and negative feelings I'm feeling right now as I find myself having to limit what I purchase? And then also additional comments are, my husband wants to buy a car, but when I look at our budget, we can't afford it because I want to be debt-free in two years, and we're also expecting a, a baby in the near future. Excellent. Yeah, that's a very good question. So it's really two questions there, hey? Um, mm -hmm. So there's the question about how do I deal with the feelings, and then there's the question about working with a partner. Um, and so in terms of the partner, it would be good to sit down and come to an understanding with your partner about what your joint plan is going to be. And it may be that each person has to shift their position slightly because sometimes, you know, we have to move in from the left and they have to move in from the right or whatever it is a little bit to come to a common ground that we can both um, get behind. I know I'm mixing my metaphors horribly, but we want to get to a common position that we can both get behind because that really changes the outcome, like I said. And in terms of the feelings, honestly, I would say just feel them. So you talked about sad, angry, and resentful. Those are fantastic feelings. Um, and I would say for me, that would be, it would come up when I sat down to write that check. If you don't physically write a check, if it's automated, then there may be a particular time of the month when you see it go out or you're aware that it's going out or whatever, that the feeling comes up and take some time to be sad, to be mad, to be resentful, all of those things. And you know, if I've got something that I'm really struggling with and I'm feeling sad about it, honestly, I will sit down first thing in the morning and get out, get out my box of tissues and feel sad about it and do it. And it's astonishing because you're like, gosh, I'm going to be sad about this for the rest of my life. And then you find once you actually sit down to feel that, that you can't really sustain it for more than like five minutes, 10 minutes at the absolute most. So it can feel as if the feeling is really big and it's going to take over your whole life. And I just have to say from my experiences that once we actually dive into it, we can swim through it and then out the other side and move on with our day. Um, and as I said, you know, mad, it's a wonderful feeling. You know, you want to you do this in a room by yourself, um, <laughs> not take it out on anybody else. But yeah, close yourself into your bedroom, whatever it is, and stomp around and wave your hands, growl, whatever it is. Um, and when we actually dive into the feelings, instead of trying to kind of, I don't know, politely ignore them, then we come right through and we can move on. So hopefully that'll help. And, you know, I'd love to hear how that goes with you. I didn't get the name of the questioner, but by all means, drop me an email um, going forward and let me know how it goes and, and what you learn. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, I'm 50 years old and my husband died last year and I have two kids, 10 and 13 years old. My husband had good life insurance, which I'm fearful of investing and spending. Many folks have given different options. My financial advisor wants me to invest in mostly mutual funds and some stock. My uncle doesn't like the fees involved in someone else managing my portfolio. Do you have any resources which are easy to understand that can help me learn how to invest? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. And um, I just want to start out by saying I'm so sorry for your loss, um, especially you know with children to take care of. That's a big responsibility. Um, so yeah, this is a question that comes up a lot of how to work with investing. What's the best way to go forward? Um, it is really important um, to learn about it ourselves, whether we use an advisor or whether we do it sort of a do-it-yourself DIY kind of a thing. It's really important to learn about investments. It's such a big field. Um, I would honestly say to sh start with um, Sharon Thakor's book, the um, On My Own Two Feet. Even though I said it's 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 uh, packaged for young women. Much of the, in the, the investment advice is still appropriate, and I really like it. The exact funds that you might choose might be different for your circumstances because your time horizon is a little bit shorter um, than, for example, a 25-year-old. Um, but the vast majority of what she has to say um, is, is spot on. Um, that and also I have a really nice, honestly, like a three page little summary from Fidelity, one of the big investment houses. That's also a really good intro to investing. It's really short, which is nice. Um, 
So if you want to drop me an email, I'd be happy to forward that to you. Also, you know, it can be difficult to find material. This is what I found when I went out looking. It can be difficult to find material that is like intro an introduction to investing, like investing from the very beginning. Um, and so that's why I recommend the On My Own Two Feet book. The other one that I really like is a book by Jane Bryant Quinn. I'm not remembering the title right now, but it's a huge book. Things got to be like two inches thick and it's got a really nice investment section. For some reason, I'm remembering chapter 21. Um, so that's what I would look at as well. And then once you've got those foundations under your feet, then you can start watching videos on the internet and reading articles and, and uh, reading blogs and so on and so forth. And I also have some blog recommendations I could give you if you want to email me. Um, but yes, definitely educate yourself. The idea of do-it-yourself versus using a financial planner. I really like a financial planner if you have, you know, sort of a certain amount of money. Um, they tend to make more sense when you've, when you've got quite a bit to invest. Um, I really like the idea of using a financial planner because what it does is it breaks that gridlock on the fear of investing. Like, where do I start? What do I do? And it gets you started and it gets you going so that at least you've got the money invested. It also breaks the gridlock of, oh my gosh, I can't get going on this. Tomorrow would be a better day. And I've been in that position myself. You know, it can take me weeks or months or whatever to get around to doing something that's not my favorite thing. So having someone that you've hired to do that for you is a real asset in that case. And then over time, it may be that you get more comfortable. It may be that you have more time. You know, if you're raising a 10 and 13 year old, you're busy. Um, and it may be that you can gradually take it over yourself. So I don't see either one as being right or wrong. Um, for myself, I particularly like uh, financial planners who charge fee for service. Um, rather than having commissions and, and uh, purchase fees and things like that. But other than that, I, I think that a financial planner can be a great asset. So hopefully that addresses the bulk of your question. Thank you. And the last question we have is asking if you have a website, which I believe is on your next slide here, if you want to click through to that. Yeah, I do. I do have, let's see, I think I, oh, I've got, yeah. It's right here at the end. I do have a website. It's www.moneymindful.org. And what's not listed here is that I also have a Facebook page and that's facebook.com slash moneymindful. So you can stay in touch through either of those. And on my website, on the home page, there's a form that you can jump in for my newsletter if you want to do that. It goes out about once a month. And uh, Facebook, I tend to post more often um, almost once a week. I strive for once a week and I don't quite make it, but almost once a week. So yes, stay in touch. I'd love that. Okay, great. And we can send out all of this information to everyone so that they have it there. You don't have to write it down now. So I would like to thank you, Linda, for an excellent presentation. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today and asked some really great questions. And thanks again, Linda. Thanks so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.